if we have at either of our metaphases, if we have a situation where we do not move one of our homologous chromosome pairs, or if we do not separate the sister chromatids in meiosis two, we have something called non-disjunction. And if we have this non-disjunction, it's going to result in a change in our ploidy. You remember what does diploid mean? Two. Two copies of each chromosome. Haploid, one copy of each. Now, if you have non-disjunction, you're going to get a daughter cell that's going to have too many of a chromosome or sets of chromosomes, depending on how many don't move in the right direction. And so you call that polyploidy. Polyploidy is too many. Poly means many. And you can also imagine if it doesn't separate, there's going to be a daughter cell that gets shortchanged that is missing a chromosome. And when you put A or N in front of a word, what does that mean? Not or without. If someone is asymptomatic, what does that mean? They don't have symptoms. So aneuploidy is missing a chromosome or missing a set of chromosomes. So non-disjunction can lead to these things and typically when you have these chromosomal anomalies, many are incompatible with life. Only a few lead to actual birth, such as Down syndrome, but you know those individuals are highly disadvantaged. So when you bring two people together and you contribute a sperm and an egg and you get a unique individual, they are simply not half one parent and half the other because there is a shuffling of the deck of cards. There is that mixing of the genetic material that occurs partly because of crossing over, but partly because of the genetic rearrangements that go on. <clears throat> so we need to talk about our genetic variability. And a lot of this gets at Mendel's experiments. And when he looked at his pea plants and discussed and, and found out how does heredity, how do parents pass on their traits? And there are two laws that are going to govern our variability, and then we'll talk about crossing over at the very end. But just going back and reviewing what Mendel did. Mendel took pure bled, pure bred plants. They were homozygous. And what does homozygous mean? The same. What was the same? Hmm? Close, Mendel was looking at physical traits. So when he talks about homozygous, we're talking about certain alleles. And when we look at our pea plants, he's talking about tall versus short, smooth versus rough peas, green versus yellow. He had a number of different traits. And so his plants, he knew, were pure homozygous plants, even though he didn't really understand what that meant. And as he bred them out, he looked at the ratios of traits that resulted to get an idea that, okay, we're working with these things in pairs. And for the pea plants, there must be a dominant and recessive relationship for these traits. And so what he found is if you took two pure parents and bred them, those are going to be the parents. The offspring he referred to as an F1. And he would see that in those F1 individuals, they were all the same. So, but, wait, sorry. No. Uh, so it's the, the, the pure are pure of two different things, correct? Correct. Okay. okay. Yeah. Because if they were pure of the same yeah. thing, then, of course, everything's always yeah, going right, to be right. the same. So he would take a purebred tall plant and a purebred short plant, for instance, breed them together, and all the F1, the first generation of offspring, would all be of the dominant trait. But then he took those first generation and bred them together. And what the resulting offspring were in the, that second generation, they were not all the same. And when you looked at the physical trait, tall versus short, you would always get a three to one ratio. 75% would be tall, for instance, and 25% would be short. And so he said, okay, well, this trait must be dominant since there's 75% that result in the F2. The 25% must be a recessive trait. 
And so in this case, he was looking at yellow uh, plants versus green plants, yellow being the dominant trait, green being the recessive trait. So here are our homozygous P, our homozygous parents. So you know if you breed those homozygous parents together, what are all the offspring? What do they have to be for their genotype for color? Now that's the phenotype. Yellow is the phenotype. What would their genotype have to be? Okay, they've got at least one dominant. And we know which parent they got that from, right? The homozygous dominant yellow parent. But what did they have to get from the green parent? A recessive trait. So in our F1s, they're all going to have one dominant and one recessive. Is that homozygous now? It's heterozygous. And so all of our offspring, 100% are heterozygous and 100% are yellow. Now, let's take two of these individuals and breed them together. And what we're going to see in this experiment, this is where we get our 75% phenotypic ratio, 3 to 1, 75 to 25. And we can actually calculate these out with what we call the Punit square. And so for a simple cross of one trait, we call it a monohybrid cross. And this is how Mendel set this up. You put the two alleles for one parent along the top. You put another, the uh, second parental alleles along the left-hand side. And you simply fill in the boxes. So from this parent, both of these on the left, they're going to get that dominant yellow Y. They've got the recessive Y. That's going to come down on the right-hand side. The same thing, contribute the dominant Y across the top and the recessive Y across the bottom. And what you get as a result, you get one individual that is homozygous dominant. You can see that in the upper left. You get two individuals that are heterozygous. They're in the right-hand upper corner and the left-hand lower corner. And then you get one individual that is homozygous recessive. That's the bottom right. So when you look at those individuals that have the genotype sufficient to give them the yellow color, which is at least one dominant, how many of our four are going to be yellow? Three. And one is going to be green. That is our three to one ratio. And when you look at the genotypic ratio, it's one to two to one. One dominant homozygous, two heterozygotes, and one homozygous recessive. So that's the difference between our phenotypic and our genotypic ratio when you're doing this one cross. And that's how Mendel then, looking at all these characteristics, he came up with these two laws of heredity. And by and large, they hold true even today what we know about genes and alleles and chromosomes. So Mendel has a law of segregation and a law of independent assortment. These sound very much alike, but we're going we're gonna to dissect them out so that we can understand exactly what we're talking about. So let's look at segregation first. Um, I thought we were getting that. No. So Mendel's law of segregation, two alleles of a gene are distinct entities. And these two alleles separate from one another during the formation of the gametes, the sperm and the egg. So what we're talking about is your blood type. You have two alleles that dictate what your blood type is in all of your cells. And that those markers are going to be expressed on your red blood cells. But you can only give one of those from you to your child. You can't give them both. Now, if you have A, B, blood, go back and think about our Punit square. What are the chances that your child is going to get that A allele from you? If you have A, B, blood, if you have A, B, blood, what's the chances your child is going to get the A allele from you? 50%. And the chances of getting the B allele are 50%. If you have five children, your first four have A-type blood, what's the chance of that fifth child getting A-type blood? 
50%. Because it doesn't matter. Each and every time, it's going to be independent of A versus B. Half of your gametes will have A, half will have B. Regardless of what A does, B is going to do its thing. But you can only get one. So you see, they're distinct. They're never going to be together. Don't we have like dominant things, Now, what, okay, what about blood? Is blood type dominant? No, it is not. Because you have A and B expressed in some individuals. So when you have both alleles expressed, what do we, you remember what we call that? It's not dominant, but mm -mm, something before dominant. Codominant. Codominant. So that would be the example of blood type. Okay? So segregation, the alleles segregate. One goes into your sperm and the other stays behind. They can't both go together. Now, the independent assortment, this has to do with different genes. Because they say the alleles of one gene segregate independently of the alleles from other genes. Scratch out alleles, because that's where it gets confusing. Because in segregation, we're talking about alleles for the same gene. In independent assortment, we're talking about different genes. So your blood type gene is going to do its thing. And that's going to be completely independent of what your hair color genes and alleles are doing. You see what I'm saying? The only time this is not going to necessarily be true is when those genes are close to each other on the same chromosome. Then they're linked. And we have a lot of traits that we call sex linked because those genes are on your sex chromosomes, either the X or the Y. And that's why sometimes guys get really shortchanged. Because if someone's going to be colorblind, who likely is those, are those individuals to be colorblind? Men. Because colorblindness is a recessive trait, and it's on the X chromosome. So guys, if your mother is colorblind, you're going to be colorblind. You have to be. For a female to be colorblind, she's going to have to have two alleles, one on each X chromosome, so that she physically manifests colorblindness. So that means the X you get, either one is going to make you colorblind because you're getting a Y from dad. If your dad's colorblind and your mom isn't, ladies, and you're not, you're a carrier. If your dad is colorblind, you are a carrier of the colorblind gene, and your son's going to have a 50-50 shot at being colorblind also. You understand how that works? But again, that's completely independent of what your blood type's going to be. So segregation about alleles for the same gene, independent assortment about different genes. Each is going to do its own thing unless they're on the same chromosome. So Mendel had no clue what DNA was or what chromosomes were. He knew there was something that was carrying the code that was passed on from parent to offspring and so on. But we know now that's all wrapped up in our chromosomes, in our genes, and in our alleles. So when we look at our explanation of the laws of segregation, we can see that clearly in meiosis 1 because here's where we have our homologous chromosomes pairing at metaphase 1 and they separate. And when they move apart, that's the segregation of the chromosomes and the separation of those alleles that were on those chromosomes. So that's the law of segregation. Now, when we look at different chromosomes within those cells, they're going to align along the midline, but how they end up in those daughter cells, you know, again, you may get two of the same chromosome from dad and two of the, uh, I mean, like chromosome one and chromosome two, both of those from dad, chromosome one and two from mom in those daughter cells. But over here, you might get one from dad and two from mom. So the chromosomes are independent of each other. Therefore, the genes on those different chromosomes 
are completely independent of what's going on. So when you look at all of our potential gametes, I mean, there is a ton of variability. That's why you look like a blend of your mom and dad, and sometimes you have traits that neither have, because you may end up getting traits that your grandparent had. So crossing over, we talked about it briefly. Remember, this happens in meiosis one. Which phase does it happen? Does crossing over happen in? You don't, you don't have to. You don't have to remember the specific subphase, but that and that should help clue you in to which phase cro crossing over happens in. Prophase one. Remember, when we're talking meiosis, you always have to put a number. So prophase one, we have crossing over. And when you look at crossing over, what's going to happen is those pair of homologous chromosomes come together and their genetic material, their DNA gets tangled up. Do you see how the red and the blue arms are sort of twisted together on the left? And so when you separate out those homologous chromosomes, those pieces are going to be interchanged so that in our daughter cells, here's a mostly red chromosome that's got a little piece of the blue. Here's the blue chromosome that has a little piece of the red. So do you see now these offspring are getting a chromosome that neither mom nor dad had, but it is a mixture of the two. Again, helping with the genetic variability in continuation of the species. Now we'll get back to crossing over, but let's, let's just look here first. Bacteria. Basically bacteria when they reproduce sexually. It's a process called conjugation. They're going to form a little tunnel between the two bacteria and they can exchange genetic material. Typically, it's going to be a little circular piece of DNA called a plasmid that's going to be exchanged. And the way this happens is dependent on a gene called F factor being present in the genome. And so the F factor forms this sex pillus, this conjugation tube, some people refer to it. And so donors are going to have that sex pillus gene, which is called F+. Plus. The recipients typically don't have that. So some people refer to these as either male, female, even though that's you know, a, a stretch to make that comparison. And when you form that sex pillus, that's where the genetic material can be exchanged from the F plus cell through the sex pillus into the F negative cell. Now, guess what one of the genes is going to be that's transferred? The F gene. So now that bacteria can go on and exchange genetic material. But it's not just the F gene that gets exchanged. There are a lot of other genes that get exchanged, including those genes that may help those bacteria be resistant to antibiotics or have other survival advantages that that F plus bacteria somehow uh, uh, produced either through mutations or just selective survival. So that's one way that bacteria can continue to survive in some harsh situations and that's why when you take your antibiotics, take them all so that you can wipe them out quickly and not leave some moderately resistant strain that's going to come back with a vengeance. So here's, here's our crossing over. That was just a little D2 or 3 bacteria. But what's going to happen in our crossing over? You can see our red and our blue chromosomes. We're going to have a little bit of a strand break. And when we hit these strand breaks, you can see that we're going to entangle some of our blue chromosome with our red chromosome. And when you have a break, what's the cell going to try to do? repair the DNA. And as the cell tries to repair the DNA, because you're trying to synthesize more and you've got a different strand that we're thinking is the template, this whole cell repair process is going to form something that is called the chiasmata. Now the chiasmata is crossing over. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people that get their feelings really hurt when there's any sort of religious undertone to anything that you do. So these days, scientists are referring to it as the holiday junction. Kind of like 
in the month of December, many people are going to say happy holidays instead of the other. Chiasmata means cross and crossing over because of the entangled nature. So whether you want to call it holiday or crossing over, either one should be clearly understood because once you make the crossing over and the chromosomes sort of slide apart as they separate, that's how you end up with the exchange of genetic material. Now, is that going to lead to any kind of mutation in the offspring? You're wanting to say no, and it's correct. The answer is no, because the material that's being exchanged are the same genes from the same regions of the homologous chromosome, so you're not losing or gaining genes. You're simply exchanging the alleles for those genes. So you're going to have a perfectly normal constitution of DNA unless there had been a mutation somewhere down the road that's, that's passed on. But yeah, there's no mutation in that whatsoever. <clears throat> so here is a, a situation. We talked about sex link genes. Okay, that's clearly you're, you're getting it either on the X or the Y chromosome. But non-independent assortment. Basically, we're talking about genes that are really, really close to one another. And if crossing over did occur, those genes would go or stay. They're not going to be rearranged even because of crossing over. So if genes are very close, if their loci are extremely close to one another, we say that is non-independent assortment because this gene is always going to go with just this gene no matter what. So that's the only exception to our independent assortment rule. 